Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all for this SET webinar, and I hope you are all healthy and safe back home. Uh, my special thanks to our four speakers, Rika, Madeleine, Sam, and Naomi, to join us and spend these next nine minutes sharing uh, their knowledge in this uh, very strange times, if I say that. Um, to, to my special guests, if you guys don't mind, I would like to switch back to Portuguese. And uh, I'm going to introduce yourselves in Portuguese and also giving the attendees a contest about the session, pretty much what we have discussed back in Monday in preparation for the webinar. So I'm going to speak in Portuguese from now on, and then I switch back to English to invite all of you. Ok? Olá, boa tarde a todos. É um prazer estar aqui com vocês nesse nosso seminário da SETE. Esse painel ele estava previsto para acontecer lá no nosso evento tradicional, no 730, e naturalmente, em função da Covid, ele tem agora uma nova configuração. É, e ele trata de um tema que eu acho que ele é absolutamente relevante para o momento que a gente está vivendo, né? que são os grandes desafios que afetam uma indústria que passa por um processo de transformação que eu, em quase 40 anos de carreira, nunca vi em tamanha dimensão. É, olhando no tempo, né, talvez daqui a 10, 15 anos, 20 anos, os jovens engenheiros que estão aí nos acompanhando poderiam pensar é, nessa época que aqui estamos vivendo e imaginar que a pandemia foi um elemento de disrupção e que fez com que houvesse uma imensa transformação na indústria de mídia. É natural né, a gente ficar apegado a eventos específicos para tentar explicar uma mudança. Mas, a verdade, a transformação da indústria de mídia já começou há pelo menos em cinco anos, de uma forma muito acelerada. E, 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 e a crise que a gente vive hoje em função da pandemia, ela apenas muda a derivada de transformação e ela será ainda mais acelerada depois que nós entrarmos naquilo que a gente vai discutir hoje, que é a nossa nova normal. Quais são os principais elementos né, que exigem de nós, radiodifusores, uma profunda reflexão? Primeiro é que, como engenheiros de radiodifusão, broadcast engineers que somos, né, ao longo da nossa carreira, nós dedicamos quase toda a nossa energia é, para o processo de produção e distribuição de conteúdo, né, que é a essência do negócio de mídia, né, content is king, né, isso, essa verdade continua, né, e, e, mas as nossas carreiras, em sua grande maioria, ela foi desenvolvida em torno dos processos de produção de conteúdo. A verdade é que a indústria passou por uma profunda transformação e os nossos modelos de negócio tradicionais, sejam eles a publicidade ou os modelos de subscrição né, em assinatura, eles estão extremamente pressionados e essa pressão vem de um ambiente de transformação tecnológica, com novos players que entraram e da noite para o dia né, passaram a ter um fatias muito relevantes das nossas receitas. E, na minha visão, o principal desafio que, que, que se impõe a essa indústria e, portanto, a todos nós profissionais dela, é um foco na transformação dos nossos modelos de monetização. De que maneira a tecnologia permitirá que os nossos negócios em TV aberta, né, das nossas operações de distribuição com os nossos parceiros nas operadoras, né, possam se apropriar de modelos de negócio e métricas que são tipicamente digitais. Então, o nosso painel hoje trata, sim, desses grandes desafios, o que está acontecendo na nossa indústria, né? E, com isso, nós faremos aqui um painel que começa com a Rica. A Rica é a analista-chefe 
do IABM, que é a Associação Internacional dos Fabricantes, né? das empresas de tecnologia na área de broadcast. A Rica ela é um, formada em língua né, e literatura chinesa na Universidade de Fudan, em Xangai, e trabalha como analista de mercado. Ela vai, ela vai trazer para a gente assim, quais são as mudanças globais que estão afetando esta indústria né, e as implicações práticas para a vida da gente. Na sequência, nós teremos a Madeleine Nolan. A Madeleine ela é presidente do ATSC e, ao longo da carreira dela, ela foi é, a liderança do grupo que supervisionou o desenvolvimento do padrão ATSC 3.0. E aqui um ponto de atenção importante para essa questão do imenso desafio que a gente está vivendo, porque os atributos do ATSC 3.0 vão muito além das questões próprias de qualidade da experiência, qualidade da imagem, e sim como um enabler de grande, de novos modelos de negócio. A Madeleine ela tem mais de 15 anos de experiência na indústria, recebeu o prêmio de Mulheres Futuristas né, pela revista Miss Check, e... e tem, e tem é, uma, uma experiência muito grande para compartilhar com a gente é, nessa, nessa nossa jornada de transformação. Depois nós temos o Sam Matheny. O Sam ele é o CTO e vice-presidente executivo da NAB. Portanto, tem um papel e um conhecimento profundo do que está acontecendo na indústria do broadcast no mercado americano, ele tem mais de 25 anos de experiência na indústria, é detentor de patentes na área de TV digital, tem atuado como consultor em várias empresas de tecnologia e startups, né? e ele é bacharel em ciências e comunicação pela Universidade da Carolina do Leste, tendo é, mestrado em ciências e gestão de tecnologia pela Universidade da Carolina do Norte, e, 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 e é um especialista em inteligência artificial pelo MIT. Né? E terminaremos, portanto, o nosso painel com a, a Naomi. A Naomi ela é a chairman do conselho do IBC e o foco da Naomi é discutir né, como é que a gente aprende a viver num mundo que muda tanto. Ela vai falar profundamente da transformação nas pessoas. Né? A Naomi é engenheira né? é, é, e sua carreira foi construída dentro da indústria de radiodifusão e comunicação, tendo trabalhado no, na BBC, na ITV inglesa, na Sony, tanto na Europa como nos Estados Unidos. E agora, na, no conselho do, BBC, do, do IBC, né? ela se concentra no painel no papel né, do, que a, do que a tecnologia vai desempenhar no futuro, defendendo a tecnologia como uma grande força de mudanças positivas para a indústria. Muito bem, aqui como é que funciona a nossa dinâmica hoje? Né? Vocês têm aqui, vocês têm um chat para uma conversa entre vocês e a gente tem um espaço de Q&A que vocês podem mandar as perguntas, né, que elas serão moderadas, e apresentadas a cada um dos nossos palestrantes ao término de cada uma das, das palestras. E, no final, se a gente ainda tiver tempo e interesse, a gente pode continuar aqui a nossa conversa com os nossos quatro convidados especiais. Pois bem, então, switching back to English, uh, I would like to invite Rika. She is going to share with us the latest research of IABM on the uh, media and, and broadcast technology industry. And uh, when I mean latest, you, you uh, get to know some information of what's going on right now in the midst of this coronavirus uh, crisis. Please, Hika, the stage is yours. Thank you, Raimundo.
Yes, so um, Raimundo was already kindly um, introducing IABM. Uh, so we're a trade association with over 600 corporate members. So we are representing um, technology suppliers with then close links to also um, technology buyers as a non-profit organization. Um, agenda of my presentation consists of three parts. Uh, firstly, a few words about the business environments um, and those drivers um, of change. Um, secondly, um, I'll discuss about uh, buying trends. Um, so IABM conducts um, biannually a, a buying trend survey uh, among a big number of, of uh, technology end users. Um, and then also I will um, show some results of our coronavirus related um, survey we conducted uh, over the past one month. And then of course also um, news from the supplier side um, to end with. Um, firstly, um, when looking at the key buying trends, um, we can divide this uh, into two, uh, three layers. So at the level of business, uh, obviously the uh, majority of the end users are moving to direct to consumer platforms, which then also makes them to focus their investment on developing uh, these, uh, these capabilities. Um, this translates to, uh, to the supplier side um, as move to SaaS uh, models, which means also shift in their revenues. Um, it has financial implications uh, when uh, the frequency of buying becomes um, um, higher and, and also um, the revenues are split into smaller uh, entities. And of course, then it affects sales and profits. Um, now, coronavirus obviously has uh, also changed the, uh, the horizon and the outlook uh, for both sides, not only buyers, but also suppliers. And I will um, show something related to that. Um, secondly, um, we are seeing um, at the level of technology that, that um, media technology buyers uh, are also favoring technologies that enable them to maximize efficiency and agility. Uh, they want to streamline their content chains. And uh, then for suppliers, again, um, this, this can be seen from um, those changes um, that happen in their R&D funding and also focus um, uh, overall technology development, but also how they are becoming more collaborative um, in uh, developing uh, solutions together with buyers. And also, as I already mentioned that, um, mentioned that move to SaaS models means also that these kind of smaller software updates become continuous. Um, uh, and this obviously also uh, affects uh, different project uh, roadmaps. Um, thirdly, um, we see that at the level of relationships, um, collaboration uh, is, not, is not only between buyers and suppliers, um, but also um, we are seeing that suppliers um, are really um, collaborating with each other, but also increasingly with large public uh, uh, cloud service providers. Um, and also the relationship between buyers and, and suppliers is becoming, becoming deeper and, and this kind of continuous customer engagement is highly crucial, uh, particularly when having adopted a, a SaaS model as a new business model. Then um, how is the direct-to-consumer platform adoption happening among uh, the, the buyers? So uh, obviously uh, we have seen over the past uh, years already uh, huge investments in original content by the biggest uh, media companies, but also the new media, uh, including Netflix and Amazon and Apple and so on. And this we, we expect to continue as many of the big uh, media companies are launching uh, new OTT services, uh, some of them uh, later uh, this year and even this quarter. Um, then looking a little bit a longer uh, way back then already for several years, uh, the growth of pay TV subscriptions globally um, has been stabilizing. It grows still um, uh, stably in certain markets, particularly um, certain regional markets. But for example, in the US and in Europe, we have seen uh, recently um, big uh, court cutting, so to say, um, incidents and, and this 
will likely continue. At the same time, uh, people are favoring uh, subscription video on demand services and, and these are uh, starting to catch up pay TV scene. Um, now then looking at the, the, the effect of coronavirus. So um, IABM um, uh, recently conducted a survey called Coronavirus Impact Tracker. And these uh, implications uh, that I'm, I'm presenting are related to that survey. So our um, respondents uh, were reporting that there are a lot of cancellations of productions because of the virus, and, and it is putting a lot of pressure on production and post. Um, then at the same time, um, due to the quarantine measures, uh, there has been a, a huge increase in demand for SVOD services globally. Then um, in this process of moving to direct to consumer, um, scale is obviously uh, highly relevant and, and crucial. Um, how to get there, we have seen um, a series of, of very big uh, mergers, mergers and acquisitions over the past um, five, uh, seven years time or so. Um, uh, and this obviously helps those little bit more traditional media companies to acquire quickly those uh, direct-to-consumer and, and OTT capabilities that they need uh, to, to move fast in the very um, intense uh, competition and, and competi competitive landscape. And um, we see that also the investment, uh, uh, let's say the, the investment um, is changing due to the coronavirus. So, so of course, it's not clear how long uh, these impacts will last. It depends on the, how long the virus uh, will, will stay. But um, some companies are uh, putting invest investments on hold. At the same time, some of some who have already started uh, their established uh, technology transitions are actually ac accelerating uh, the investments towards cloud, for example. Um, in addition to mergers and acquisitions, um, to acquire new capabilities, which are um, highly crucial to make the new business models in direct-to-consumer uh, model work. Um, end users are also forming alliances and also um, teaming up uh, around two different um, fields of expertise, um, advertising technology and also streaming uh, technology. And this is obviously um, a very, very important uh, trend to, to also look at and keep eye on in the coming years. Now, according to our coronavirus survey, uh, we, we found out that uh, the rise of live news consumption um, has resulted in, in, uh, uh, in higher demand for collaborative news solutions and also new workflows related to news. So it will be interesting to watch that depending on how long coronavirus will stay with us, that how, what kind of collaborations around the news broadcasting uh, will take place. Uh, moving to uh, buyers, um, buying trends in the industry. So uh, before uh, coronavirus outbreak, um, we found that buyers were still quite confident about the global uh, outlook. So we have historically been uh, tracking the confidence already for past 10 years time, and it has mostly been uh, positive. Uh, now, looking at the uh, situation after the coronavirus outbreak, um, over half of the respondents uh, said that their revenues will decrease. So this is, of course, uh, quite worrisome uh, uh, piece of news. And particularly, the virus is causing, causing pressure on advertising and subscription revenue. And this can then translate into uh, or it will translate into lower budgets for new uh, media, media tech investments. Also, um, the investment outlook before the outbreak uh, looked quite positive, particularly for, for SaaS models. So there was clearly a shift in spending. Um, uh, respondents were saying that they are uh, uh, investment is growing in the field of 
software subscriptions and also software on demand, whereas it was clearly uh, declining in hardware products and also uh, permanent software permanent licenses. And uh, now um, with the virus, COVID-19, uh, we see that also uh, buyers have changed dramatically uh, their investment in a way that, that those who were using mainly hardware and, and legacy infrastructure have now found out how vulnerable they, they are um, uh, if they need to, to really work remotely and, and get uh, workflows um, efficiently uh, out uh, in this context. So we, it looks like uh, that this could be a lasting impact that these established uh, tech transitions would actually accelerate uh, some which uh, already had been started, but also those which, which were uh, still at the level of pilot or so. Then um, naturally um, this move to direct to consumer uh, models um, has also uh, resulted in, in a need for new skill sets and also uh, has resulted, unfortunately, a lot of staff cuts uh, among different media companies and, and technology buyers. Um, firstly, of course, technology has a role to play in this. So uh, cloud and, and artificial intelligence, machine learning um, solutions are, are helping uh, media companies to uh, augment uh, their capabilities in terms of automation and, and so on. Um, then at the same time, also adoption of these technologies mean uh, that they really need um, new IT uh, and data related skill sets uh, in-house and uh, particularly data uh, is, is something that we are, um, we are also monitoring in a way that, that um, a lot of job openings are actually uh, related to data and not only engineering. Um, it might not be a surprise um, that, that one can imagine uh, that when the budgets are getting tighter, uh, then we might see um, further staff cuts globally. Um, it's, it's, it's yet to see. Um, then um, finally, um, about supply trends. Um, so I mentioned that um, suppliers are adapting to SaaS models. Um, when they do so, uh, there, there is a cash crunch uh, in the beginning. Uh, and we have really seen that um, this was already the case uh, before uh, the COVID outbreak. Uh, now, when tracking the situation after uh, COVID-19 outbreak, also suppliers uh, said that um, a great majority of the suppliers said that they expect their revenues to uh, decrease. And um, again, um, investment is, is going away from uh, hardware uh, toward cloud, cloud offerings. And, and also um, this likely accelerates su suppliers uh, transition to SaaS models. And uh, as a result, also this cash flow crunch will, will continue temporarily at least. Um, at the level of relationships and, and how moving to SaaS models affects um, a company's actual business practices and uh, let's say sales practices, um, uh, the buying frequency becomes um, continuous or, or increases and also um, uh, the purchases are increasingly made on a monthly or even daily basis. And um, this means that cost suppliers need to be available for the customers all the time. Um, I mean, the suppliers have to be available for the customers all the time through different uh, kinds of uh, customer engagement tools um, to maximize the customer retention, which, which is very crucial for uh, SaaS, uh, successful SaaS-based uh, business. Um, as a result, uh, we have seen already over the past few years that many suppliers uh, are coming up with such engagement tools um, online and digital. Uh, there's virtual support, uh, own events like Avid Connect, for example, at NAB, um, also webinars, which then all the time keeps uh, the supplier and uh, the customers in the, in the loop. 
And um, yes, of course, also cancellation uh, of shows now uh, and different events because of the coronavirus um, also forces suppliers to, uh, to come up with new uh, tools and, and uh, engagement methods through digital uh, platforms as, as these traditional uh, ways of meeting the customer have become uh, minimal. Then um, partnering uh, between suppliers. So um, suppliers are partnering uh, increasingly with cloud uh, providers and, and IABM has been tracking cloud ad adoption in the broadcast media industry already the past uh, five, five years time. Um, or, or more, um, and as um, technology buyers move to the cloud and adopt the cloud technology, um, also the specialist uh, media technology suppliers uh, have better chance to 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 assist uh, when they are also integrated with the cloud uh, service providers uh, who are increasingly uh, able to uh, offer best of breed uh, workflows in the cloud. Um, according to our studies, um, these partnerships have mainly been focusing on manage and publish related workflows, which are also most uh, popular deployments areas for cloud technology in general. So um, this is really uh, a trend uh, among uh, the media landscape at the moment. And again, repeating the same uh, that investment is uh, shifting uh, from hardware and legacy infrastructure to towards cloud and, and likely will accelerate. Um, finally, a few words uh, also about the role of cloud service providers investment. Um, uh, over the past few years, um, uh, the largest cloud service providers, cloud service providers like AWS, uh, Google and Microsoft um, they have gradually invested heavily on media specific uh, capabilities and um, according to our recent study um, they already particularly AWS is able to offer uh, services ne in nearly all um, content chain uh, blocks uh, with focus on manage and publish obviously but we really see that they are customizing uh, their offerings, media specific offerings to broadcasters and they know their problems. So with this huge scale that they have, the huge data capabilities that they have, um, um, they are really well positioned uh, to, to do so. So for example, uh, AWS Media Convert, which is uh, media specific service in managed, uh, covers already uh, great file based video transcoding, compressing of, of VOD content, uh, Google has um, its own solution, um, and so so does Microsoft, with um, automatic extraction of metadata and closed captioning uh, recommendations. All those things that are highly crucial for uh, for media companies um, now uh, serving um, their um, in the direct to consumer platforms. Then uh, finally. Um, to conclude, have a conclusion. Uh, so these partnerships and co-development uh, is between suppliers and, and buyers um, in a way that um, buyers want to um, guarantee uh, the interoperability of, of different solutions and different technologies that they are uh, adopting and also developing in-house partly but also together with the suppliers. So if, if buyers cannot find the suitable solution um, from the market, they increasingly build it uh, themselves or then together with, with suppliers. This means that suppliers are increasingly becoming consultants, um, but also long-term partners uh, together with developing the technology roadmap. And um, when SaaS models are in place, um, this continuous customer engagement, which I mentioned before, um, also means that suppliers are increasingly uh, also knowledge providers, so they're really intermediaries, intermediaries um, for buyers, technical teams. Um, and yeah, the role of data uh, in SaaS models, uh, it means that suppliers can also monetize a new uh, 
uh, data uh, entities so they can provide services um, to monitor the performance of um, media technology buyers' investments, pricing related, uh, helping buyers to price, um, and also other activities. And this is very, very interesting and, and fascinating to, to, to see and analyze. And we keep eye on, eye on these trends and, and of course, uh, continue to report about these trends to, the, uh, to our community in the industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rika, for your presentation. So wonderful presentations. And uh, it somehow uh, shows that uh, the coronavirus is just accelerating what is already going on. Correct. Yes. Uh, and I have a question for you uh, regarding this shift from purpose built hardware, where we pretty much built this industry in the past 60 years. Right and moving to the cloud, because uh, as far as I know, and we are working on that in Globo very much, very much involved in this, in this program, uh, moving to the cloud, I, I, I haven't seen any end-to-end -end media supply chain that can be uh, delivered over a, one of those cloud providers. None of them, although they are investing media, so uh, in my opinion, uh, they, they are not at the same stage. Some of the media, media cloud, cloud providers are a little bit ahead of the others, but they are investing in the media ecosystem, but it's not there yet. But on the other hand, our traditional partners on the broadcast uh, manufacturers industry, they are struggling in this process. Uh, how do you see uh, where we are in this transition and uh, what is the outcome for our uh, traditional partners? Yes, so I think um, the transition to, to the cloud and, and adoption of the cloud technology and ecosystem, um, according to our results and, and survey, um, I mean research results, uh, there are regional differences. So, um, for example, North America, um, also Europe might be, I mean, Europe as well, um, might be quite quick to ad adopt these new, uh, new technologies, whereas then some other markets like um, Latin America or uh, also actually having a strong satellite sector uh, and also having quite strong pay TV uh, related uh, infrastructure. Uh, these markets might still um, have a kind of more options in a way um, uh, but in in for example in europe in nordic countries where, where i'm i'm from um, europe is is very fragmented market with a lot of public service uh, broadcasters uh, serving different markets who have also their own advertising uh, you know market is relatively local and in nordic countries we have seen for example really um, a push actually uh, from uh, top down um, in among public service broadcasters that YLE, Finnish uh, Yle, uh, SVT, Sverige Television, they have been actually adopting these cloud related technologies relatively quickly because they have been asked to do so. So I guess um, it's a very important question, very, very complicated question, um, but also I think it relates to that in small markets like Nordic countries, um, you have less people anyways to uh, in the customer con like consumer base. So then you have to do these these choices much more in a much faster way. Then Brazil, for example, is a huge market. You can still kind of have a smooth uh, like and continuous demand for pay TV services, and and this way. Um, the market is, is, is maybe not forcing uh, broadcasters and a more uh, traditional side of the industry to, to adopt this so quickly. I hope this answered somewhat the question. Okay, so thank you very much. And then if we have time, uh, in the end of the session, we'll be able to discuss a little bit more about uh, your, 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 your analysis. 
Okay, great. So our, our, our next speaker is uh, Madeleine Nolan, as I have presented here before. Madeleine, please uh, welcome to the stage. She's going to speak of the status of the ATSC 3.0 in the US. Uh, thank you, Raimondo. Thank you, SET, for the opportunity. And thank you, Ika, for really informative uh, um, slides, very interesting trends. Um, so this uh, webinar is about industry challenges. And uh, I would like to take a break from coronavirus, because uh, despite the fact that that is certainly a challenge for us, um, we face challenges before it. And those challenges that were there before coronavirus will be there when it's uh, when it's past us. And so I'd like to take a moment to focus a little bit on the challenges that the broadcast industry faces um, and uh, how technology can help us overcome those challenges. And speaking of technical challenges, see how my computer wants me to forward slides. Um, so some of the challenges that I think we faced have been how do we add value to our broadcasting service platform? Uh, we have this wonderful high power, high tower infrastructure. Uh, we have great data capacity. We have wonderful uh, fertile spectrum in our countries to, to broadcast. And how can we take that uh, information, that infrastructure and the talent that we have uh, in, our, in our companies to enable new business models how can we reach more viewers on more devices? In other words, how can we improve the television viewing uh, experience as well as enabling the new business models? And how can we keep up with the rapid market changes? How can we remove barriers to adopting new technologies? How can we align ourselves with other rapidly evolving platforms? Um, so these are areas that I think uh, we can look to technology to help us um, keep up in the marketplace with the trends that are changing. So a little bit of uh, first generation digital television in perspective. So turning back your time machine to when uh, most of the world was analog and digital terrestrial broadcasting was just coming online. Let's think a little bit about this. Well, here it is. Uh, this is the ATSC uh, 1.0 system. Um, thinking back there, we had analog VCRs. We had uh, Windows 3.1 using DOS machines. And we had analog cell phones, which were very large. And we had a dial-up modem, which could give you a whopping 19.2 kilobits per second of throughput. Big, big uh, movement in technology back in those days. Uh, here we are more than 20 years later, and many of us are still using, in fact, the same system. Um, Europe has advanced more quickly than others to next generation broadcasting using DVB-T2. Um, and South Korea is now on board with ATSC 3.0, having launched in 2017. Um, and I believe that uh, uh, Japanese and Chinese standards organizations are busy working on uh, next generation broadcasting systems as well. But uh, these systems, these 1.0 systems, these original DTT DTV systems have been with us for a very long time. And if you think about what has changed among media delivery since these days, uh, the mind uh, kind of uh, boggles with the, num with the amount of changes that we've seen since this was the normal and this was cutting edge technology. The uh, emergence of Netflix and Amazon and Facebook, um, the emergence of the smartphone, uh, the emergence of smart cars and smart cities, and the list goes on. So what can we do? Uh, well, we can work on a new digital terrestrial television standard uh, like uh, DPB-T2 and ATSC 3.0 that can not only help us uh, make sure that we can deliver on these new things, but can also help us make sure that we can evolve. Uh, we don't want to have a system uh, 20 years from now, which is the same one we're using today. So what can we do? Well, certainly we can get better capacity. Um, we can have more channels and more pixels or perhaps more data going through the same infrastructure that we have today. Um, we can get better reception and so we can perhaps reach uh, indoors without high, high antennas on the rooftop. 
we can reach moving vehicles, we can reach mobile phones with these new systems. We can combine uh, over the air and over the top so that hybrid business models can be possible. In the case of ATSC3, it's an all IP based system. Uh, my understanding is that the new Japanese uh, T2 system will probably be IP based as well. So this is certainly a trend um, where not only can you perhaps have hybrid operations between internet streaming and over the air uh, transmission, but perhaps also between cellular networks, between Wi-Fi systems, uh, pretty much any system that uses IP, IP based um, uh, packets could potentially be working in a hybrid heterogeneous manner with an over the air broadcast system. And we can enhance our consumer experience. We can have better video, better audio, new codecs, improved accessibility, interactivity, advanced emergency messaging, which is another key piece. Um, and uh, one thing to kind of remind us is that uh, I think that MPEG is going to be soon four generations of video codecs ahead of the codecs that we have been using in the US on, uh, on our digital transmission. So we've been, we are on MPEG-2 video codec using the ATSC 1.0 system. And uh, we're now going to be using HEVC. And before we know it, here comes VVC and EVC and all kinds of other things. Um, and I'm going to come back to that as a, as a point of reference in a minute. But uh, some of the most important things will be new business models. And some of those new business models might be related to television, uh, such as advanced advertising. Potentially we can do pay-per-view or subscription services. There may be some capacity for service usage reporting, in other words, data collection. And then uh, I think that last point, data casting, is perhaps one of the biggest pieces on this entire um, slide, which is that we can branch out from the traditional television business, perhaps, into other businesses, such as sending software updates to a fleet of rental cars. Um, there's all sorts of things for a one-to-many broadcast system um, where that particular uh, data delivery network is the most efficient for certain types of use cases. So one of the major advancements, of course, is in terms of the capacity of the system where you see A53 here on the slide, this is the data capacity and the operating point of the ATSC 1.0 system, the system that's in use in the US today. You'll notice that at 15 uh, decibels SNR, we can get about 19 point something uh, megabits per second, which is good. Um, then on the screen, you see the Shannon limit, which is the theoretical limit between the trade off of how much data can I send and how strong can my signal be? And you'll notice two things when you compare the, the red and green with the A53 dot. Of course, the first thing you might notice is that it's closer to the Shannon limit, um, which means that the capacity at 15 uh, decibels SNR is about 30% higher than the previous system. But the other thing that is perhaps equally important is that you'll see that the, it is now a continuum or a line of possibilities rather than a point of possibility. So we have all these different possibilities uh, within the DVB-T2 and the ATSC 3.0 systems and broadcasters can choose where on this continuum they wish to operate. So it's a very flexible system. In some cases, broadcasters may wish to use low capacity and highly robust signals. And in other cases, they might choose a high capacity signal with less robustness. Um, and the good thing about these systems is that broadcasters can do both at the same time. So for example, you may have uh, a high capacity, less robust signal, which could be your 4K signal, and you might have a low capacity, more robust signal, which might be for your mobile signals. Um, in addition, if you are following different business models, you may have multiple television programs available, uh, perhaps a main channel in UHD or high definition, and several sub channels in high definition or even standard definition. And then you may have additional data capacity allocated to downloading software to the Internet of Things. So a lot of possibilities here for broadcasters to explore new business models as our marketplace changes around us. 
One of the exciting things about the new technologies is that you can do mobile mobility for the first time. Uh, what you see here is actually the um, Olympics. This was the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Games in South Korea. And the map shows a route between the Olympic Village and the hockey arena and the bus, which was uh, bringing athletes and spectators between the two systems, uh, excuse me, between the two sites. And on the bus were seven televisions. All those televisions were receiving ATSC 3.0 signals while the bus was driving at highway speeds. Um, and this was done with one single high power, high tower infrastructure uh, along the route. And at the NAB show, we had a, an automated vehicle which was driving very, very slowly around the convention center, but nonetheless, uh, and it was also receiving ATSC 3.0 signals off of Black Mountain at the, in, in Las Vegas. So mobility is a real thing. Opportunities perhaps, as I say, for cars, trains, uh, mobile phones, and the like. But now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, how to evolve the system so and, and have a system that is flexible enough to keep up with rapidly changing market. The key here is the bootstrap. Um, the bootstrap is the most basic signaling function in the ATSC 3.0 system, and it tells the receiver the most basic information about the signal. Um, for example, what version of ATSC is being delivered? Um, for example, what is the bandwidth? Um, it doesn't assume that there's a fixed bandwidth for a given country. For example, a, uh, US is on six megahertz. Many other countries are on eight megahertz. The bootstrap doesn't assume that you're on six or you're on eight or you're on five or 10 or anything. The bootstrap will tell the receiver every single time what it is. Um, and it has other uh, important basic signaling. The main thing about the bootstrap is that the receiver assumes nothing. And that's a very important thing because one of the reasons why it's so hard for broadcasters to evolve is because we are afraid that we are going to um, make it so that older receivers cannot render our programming. And so we can't move forward without abandoning our audience. The bootstrap is one of the key items that allows the older television sets and receivers to continue operating while new services are being provided in the bitstream. Here's an example of how this works. Um, in this case, uh, you have a physical layer frame. You have the two bootstraps uh, showing the borders of the physical layer frame. And in this case, you have three different kinds of data that are being sent, the orange, the blue, and the pink. And uh, those might be your main channel, it might be uh, plus a sub-channel, and it might be some you know, data to cars or, or what have you. Uh, and again, the bootstrap is the main thing. And here's the key behind it. One of the elements of signaling in the bootstrap tells the receiver when is the next similar frame coming. So what this allows you to do is you can have regular television or ATSC 3.0 or whatever it is in one frame, and then you can have some future frame. Who knows what it's gonna be? Maybe it will be very similar to what you have today, but it will be the next video codec. Or maybe it will be something that has nothing to do with television. Uh, maybe you're sending little bits of data to smart agriculture and television sets have no idea what it is. They don't care. They don't want to know. They're never going to figure it out. This allows you to do all of these things at the same time. From the point of view of the television set, it knows when the next frame is coming that it can understand and it will just wait for that frame. Uh, it's been very exciting. This has been proven to work uh, with a couple of different technologies where you can take off the shelf receivers and they do successfully skip the evolutionary frames in order to continue presenting the service that they know how to present. This is one of the most important things for overcoming our industry challenges. One of the greatest industry challenges that broadcasters face is because of our infrastructure, which happily is moving toward the cloud, but nonetheless, we still have our towers and we still have receivers out there in the field. 
one of the things that's very difficult is for us to keep up with how quickly OTT services can evolve. So here we are 20 years into ATSC 1.0, for example. Meanwhile, a company like Netflix might be updating their, their app every three months. So trends like, so technology like this allows the broadcasters to think about how they can evolve much more quickly. And I think that many of the things that Rika was talking about, about sort of cloud usage of cloudification of your operation, um, can also help broadcasters move much faster. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, the physical layer, the radio waves, and the receivers on the other end of those radio, radio waves have to be able to cope with change. And this is one of the key advancements that, uh, that next-gen uh, broadcasting can bring to the table. I know Brazil is uh, working on um, ISDBT, sort of the, a 2.5 version where you're bringing on some of the great new video capabilities like HDR, um, and, and that's really wonderful. And it's going to be uh, a, a transition, and it'll be very, very fascinating to see how that happens, but I, I'm excited about that. Another important piece I talked about earlier is the IP-based um, backbone. So 3.0 right now is the only DTT standard that specifies IP transport. Um, I'm expecting that ISDB T2 uh, will do this eventually. Um, but the key is that uh, you have broadcast and broadband, and you have, of course, different physical layers and different link layers. But when you get to the IP layer, then you can have convergence. And you'll notice that in the middle of the diagram, you see the root transport um, system. This is a variation of flute, and it allows you to transport dash segments over broadcast. Um, and where dash segments are also delivered over, over the top um, streaming platforms, now you can envision sorts of hybrid services where you might be switching between OTA and OTT, perhaps on a, on a dash segment or on a dash period. This could enable, for example, content substitution, such as ad insertion for targeted ads, or alternate endings, or people who want to watch the rest of the um, you know, uh, game, which is an overtime, versus people who want to watch the regularly scheduled program that's, that is supposed to start now. So all kinds of possibilities when you're using the IP data layer. Another key piece is the security. Um, if you're going to go IP and you're going to be part of this world and you think that you might be delivering software updates to the Internet of Things, it better be secure. Um, and in the ATSC 3.0 system, uh, a number of security elements are in place, including uh, securing the studio to the transmitter link, securing any tables, signaling tables and applications that are in the emission so that the receivers can validate the source and of course, content encryption. And in the case of ATSC 3.0, it's based on the common encryption um, used by most uh, online streaming services, such as a Widevine, PlayReady, like that. And then again, as I was saying, perhaps one of the most important things is opening up new business opportunities and new verticals for the broadcasters. Here you have your high power, high tower infrastructure, you have a wonderful staff, you have a great system and a great capacity to be able to do a lot of things. So television is one of those things, but with a new system, particularly where you can have evolutionary frames in your physical layer, you can do all sorts of things today, tomorrow, and going forward. Um, so it can be a large IP data delivery pipe. Um, and you can consider yourself to be a wireless data delivery operator, um, perhaps even connecting towers to make a regional network. Um, and this allows a terrestrial broadcaster to potentially compete with other data delivery networks um, for particular one-to-many use cases. And it's possible that this could be the most efficient way to deliver, for example, a software update to a large number of devices. Um, it may be the most efficient way to send the map changes to all the cars. It might be, you know, there's all sorts of things that could be considered. Um, another potential is a partnership with one of the streaming services. So if you envision that the grand finale of the most popular streaming show is going to be released for the first time tomorrow, 
the broadcaster might be able to offer bandwidth to pre-position that um, program as close to the edge as possible in, in the house in some cases in order to relax this, the pressure on the uh, content delivery networks at the time of the event. So there are many things for people to think about from the, as broadcasters and how we can use the, how we can leverage the systems that we have, the spectrum that we have, and the infrastructure that we have. And next generation broadcasting technology can help us face those challenges and can help us keep up and move forward as market trends evolve quicker and quicker every day. Thank you. Okay, Madeleine, thank you very much. Um, we, we do have some questions arriving on the Q&A and uh, I would like to uh, pass one of the questions for you. Um, considering the great flexibility of the ATSC 3.0, uh, and and uh, the current state of the technology, and you got you, as as the ATSC president, uh, we consider that you are having many discussions with the broadcasters uh, all over the U.S. My question is: uh, What is the preferred business model the the broadcasters are willing to adopt? Consider ATSC 3.0 because you mentioned you have uh, advanced advertising, subscription services, data services, uh, mobile. What are they they considering to adopt uh, by the launch time? Mm. Well, it's a very good question. Um, I think there's a kind of a funny um, saying in the U.S. If you've spoken with one broadcaster you've spoken with one broadcaster. Um, there are hundreds of broadcasters in the US and uh, they have lots of different ideas. And this is one of the reasons why the ATSC3 system is so flexible is because broadcasters demanded flexibility to follow the business models that they felt were most important for their businesses. And they do have different business models and different business ideas. That said, um, certainly all the broadcasters, when you think about an initial launch of ATSC 3.0, the first and most important thing is to put out television. And the television needs to be better than ATSC 1.0. So if someone goes out and buys a brand new television with the next gen TV logo on it, and they plug it in and they, they're in a market that has a 3.0 signal up and they tune to the 3.0 signal and it frankly looks the same as the 1.0 signal, um, they might be disappointed. And so broadcasters know that very well and they think that the first thing they must do is get watch TV online, live and looking really, really good with better video, better audio and perhaps some interactivity that consumers can, can see and you know, understand the, the, the improvements that they've received. Once we get past that, um, and I think that time will, it will take time for more and more content to be produced in those kinds of high quality um, audio and video capabilities. So what you might find in the early days in the US is you might find some initial programming at full HD with better audio um, and HDR, and over time adding more and more 4K content, more and more HDR content, and perhaps moving into 7.2 plus 4 channels, things like that. Um, and interactivity, I think, will start at kind of a, a you know, a, a reasonable level with perhaps weather bugs or, you know, ability to do catch-up TV and VOD, which has proven to be uh, quite a popular um, interactive ca capability in Europe. Looking beyond watch TV, uh, you get a lot of different ideas. Some broadcasters are very focused on mobile. Um, some broadcasters have business interests outside the U.S. and are focused on other markets. Some broadcasters are already talking with car rental companies and working on business arrangements there. Um, some broadcasters are thinking more and more about how to enhance their television systems with dynamic ad insertion, um, you know, uh, different camera views for sporting events, uh, all sorts of things. So I would say that the number one priority that I'm hearing is get this thing launched, make it look great, get consumers excited about it. 
And once we get that under our belts, let's do A, more of that, and B, let's explore these other verticals that are of great interest to us. So thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. And uh, this is for me, I'm sorry, <laughs> many questions. Uh, and uh, given that we are in Brazil, so many attendees is asking if uh, Brazil is somehow planning to adopt ATSC 3.0 or, uh, or giving away the current uh, standards of ISDBT. Uh, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, we, are, we have a very powerful standard in place and uh, I don't see any, any uh, possibility to change or decide on the next generation standards on the near term. We, are, we still have many opportunities to uh, evolve the current standard that we have. ISDBT is a great standard. We have bandwidth available for, to provide data services. We have just announced the evolution of the standard to accommodate a more um, immersive audio systems and HDR as well, but mostly important, what we call the hybrid broadcast broadband data ecosystem, which means that uh, based on the new TV sets that is going to be launched in Brazil uh, on this year, still this year, uh, some very interesting experience we'll be able to deliver to our customers. So I really don't think that we are ready for a decision on a next generation standard, but I think the, 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 the broadcast community in Brazil should embrace what we are calling the TV 2.5, TV 2.5, which is this enhanced capabilities for the current standard that we have. Yeah, I think that um, this makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that there are different market forces in different countries um, that, uh, that make the path forward for broadcasters um, point one way or another way. Uh, I think that the work that is going on in Brazil with T2.5 is very exciting. Um, and, you know, it's interesting in the U.S., ATSC did specify uh, H.264 at one point, AVC, uh, but it was never adopted because of various market forces in, in this country. Um, you look at other countries where there's most of the television viewing takes place on the mobile phone. Um, not a lot of big TVs in that country, and they have different use cases. Um, so I think that each country is different. Uh, I know that uh, Brazil has looked at the UVT2, they've looked at ATSC 3.0 a little bit, um, and I'm sure that uh, when ISDBT2 is available, that will certainly be you know, on people's radar. Um, and I think people are also thinking about the 3GPP, one-to-many system, EMBMS, FEMBMS, um, or whatever it becomes in the 5G world. So there are a lot of options, but um, you know, I think that uh, your point is, 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 is spot on. Um, what do we need to do? Let's not do things that we don't need to do. Let's do the things that we do need to do. Um, and at least in, in the US and in South Korea, the things that they felt were most important was to get the better compression and the better physical layer capacity so that we can do 4K and we can do multiple channels and we can do a skinny bundle of 16 channels or, or we can do two 4K channels and deliver software updates at the same time. So these things were, were sort of high on the requirements list and which, uh, which prompted sort of the, 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 the non-backward compatible evolution in this case. But it will, it will be up to each individual country and, and even each individual broadcaster within that country um, when it's a voluntary adoption. And uh, I think it's great what's happening in Brazil and I think we can learn a tremendous amount from each other. Um, perhaps uh, what happens in the US, some business models will be very exciting and Brazilian will look and say, hey, that, that looks pretty good, we should try that. And perhaps we will look at what you guys are doing and say, what, what a great step forward they're taking and, and we can learn from that as well. So uh, yeah, I think, that, I think that all these possibilities are open. Thank, thank you very much, Madeleine. Thank you. So uh, let's move to our next speaker.
Uh, Sam Matthew, as I mentioned, he is the CTO and Executive Vice President of NAB, and uh, he's going to share what's going on in the U.S. right now. Hi, Welcome. great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I uh, can't help but note that uh, to this week is the week that NAB show was uh, to be held, and um, I am really sorry I'm not able to be able to see you all in person uh, at NAB show, but I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be able to talk with you uh, in this setting uh, via Zoom. So um, what I really wanted to do was break my um, uh, session down into uh, three core areas. One of them is going to be a brief overview of television in the U.S. and broadcast television in the U.S. in particular. Uh, then I wanted to talk about ATSC3 and Next Gen TV and, and how broadcasters are thinking about it uh, and what the benefits are. Uh, and then from there, I wanted to wrap up with sort of how will we get there? How will we get from uh, using the 1.0 uh, system that we have today to, to getting to uh, full uh, deployment of next-gen TV? So um, this is a quick look at uh, TV in the United States. Uh, you're talking about 100, just over 120 million uh, households and uh, over almost 310 million people uh, that are, are making up the market. And when you look at how people are getting uh, their content. 29% um, uh, 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 actually own antennas. And so, um, uh, and then there's a further breakdown of that. That does not mean that 29% of people are uh, using that antenna as the way that they consume their content, but, um, uh, or the exclusive way that they're getting their broadcast content. Um, uh, nearly two thirds of them also subscribe to a cable or satellite service. Um, nearly a third of them also uh, stream. Uh, and only about 10% of those owners uh, use the antenna as their only way of accessing broadcast, uh, broadcast content. And what we know about that is that uh, in terms of TV status, these are slightly different numbers because they're different sources, but you know, still largely about 70% of folks are using some sort of multi-channel uh, multi service. And, uh, and it varies uh, by households, as you can see here. Uh, and this particular data set looks at it from a standpoint of, um, of sort of ex exclusive usage. Um, except uh, the, what I really wanted to point out in this slide was the notion that um, it is the over the air that is growing. Uh, in this case, this is a one year snapshot from 2018 to 2019. Uh, over the air consumption of broadcast content is growing as well as streaming is growing. Those two things are growing together while that really traditional uh, sort of um, cable bundle uh, is what is under pressure and is in decline. Um, so let's see here. Uh, and now, this other thing you have to take in, or that we have to take into account, is really broadcasters are definitely broadcasters, but they're also multi-platform digital media companies. Uh, they are uh, distributing uh, their content many, many different ways. Uh, we're doing that via traditional live television. We're doing it via webs, uh, via the web. We're doing it via apps. We're doing it. Uh, via any of a number of uh, different platforms, whether that's a Fire TV, an Apple TV, uh, a Roku, uh, many different types of streaming services. So that is really to say that broadcasters are uh, using their over-the-air signals, but they're also very much uh, engaged in this new uh, digital uh, distribution. Wanted to hit quickly on the business side of it, maybe a little bit away from the technology side, because, you know, as this uh, chart from BIA shows, still really the, the large majority of the income is still driven by the traditional business. And, uh, and, but, but again, as a percentage, you can see that the, all of the um, growth is really coming from the digital services. So broadcasters are looking at how do we map that sort of business model? The big thing that we're looking at is uh, right now, in the, in, and we're in the middle of it, is a spectrum repack where nearly a thousand stations are uh, being moved to a new television channel. Um, 
because of coronavirus, um, uh, we do believe that this may uh, get extended uh, out a little bit further. Uh, but uh, even uh, with that, we still expect at the end of this um, uh, phase 10, which is supposed to come up in July, that we're still going to have about 250 of these stations approximately that will still need additional tower work uh, to be done. So they may be uh, on a, uh, on a, on a uh, temporary facility. But the importance of that as it relates to ATSC-3 is that if these stations have been repacked and they've moved to a new channel, uh, it also means that they've likely got a new transmitter that is ATSC-3.0 capable um, with a simple upgrade. And so as we think about that and we think about ATSC and what broadcasters are doing, I sort of look back in time and I won't read this entire quote to you, but this really came uh, from back in the, uh, in the 1990s. I worked at WREL-TV and Capital Broadcasting and we launched the first digital TV station in the country and our CEO at the time uh, talked about all the ways that um, uh, digital television was better than analog and he just simply said and better is better and then we fast forward some 20 years later I was still at Capital Broadcasting and I was working with his son uh, Jimmy Goodman and we were working on ATSC3 and he just looks over at me one day and he goes you know what it would be better if we had something better and so for uh, really a lot of the reasons that uh, uh, Madeline went over, uh, we believe, broadcasters in the United States believe that ATSC 3.0 is certainly better. Now, Madeline went over the technical details of why that was, but we looking at it as a consumer offering are really saying there's better picture, there's better audio, there's better engagement through the interactivity, there's better distribution, ultimately, by being an IP uh, network and, and being able to tap into other IP networks and devices. Uh, there's better pr uh, security for content protection. Um, and probably most importantly, there is better ability to uh, configure your station the way you want to. Now that could be through modulation encoding of your high tower, high power station. That could by, by using um, uh, multiple uh, physical layer pipes or even going uh, uh, to the uh, creation of a single frequency network or SFN. But better uh, is what is possible. Now, had we been at NAB show, this would be one of the demonstrations that sort of combines a variety of these things together. Of course, 4K uh, ultra high definition content is something that can be broadcast over the ATSC3 uh, signal, uh, but it uses a great deal of bandwidth, especially compared to uh, some of the other formats that are, uh, that are available. Uh, but one of the things that is great about this being an IP network is that, um, and some of the other features of ATSC3 is that you can use a scalable uh, ATSC3 encoder, uh, and then you can deliver that content via both um, a, a cloud or other IP channels or the traditional broadcast. Um, and what we were uh, going to be demonstrating uh, was the idea that we would deliver uh, a base layer, if you will, over the air, and then we would deliver an enhancement layer uh, over uh, a cloud system to um, uh, offer folks who had both the broadband and the broadcast connectivity uh, the ability to get the four, uh, 4K. But as Madeline hit on in her presentation, uh, even if you were just getting um, the over-the-air signal, you would be getting an HD with HDR. So better picture from the beginning, uh, but also the ability to really scale to 4K. This model is important in the United States because um, we have not been granted any new spectrum in which to broadcast with. And so we're really talking about being in a channel sharing environment for a while. All of this has to do with Next Gen TV, uh, and this is the logo that was developed by the Consumer Technology Association uh, to go on TV sets. So we're talking about that core TV service when we're thinking about that. And so the, um, uh, these companies, LG, Samsung, and Sony, uh, made announcement at Consumer Electronics Show earlier this year of a, um, a variety of different TV sets that will be coming out in a number of different sizes. These are coming on the market in the United States uh, this year, and so we're excited to have uh, devices that will match our rollout.
Uh, this is a Kickstarter campaign that I was notified of yesterday, um, and uh, it has already hit its goal. Uh, this is for something called the uh, Quattro 4K. This is a, a device that's going to have four tuners in it. Two of them are going to be 3.0 tuners. I checked this Kickstarter campaign today, uh, and it's uh, already over 200,000. So lots of interest uh, in um, ATSC3 um, next generation television uh, receivers that uh, can be used with existing TV sets. I wanted to quickly hit on some of what we're doing. This is a photo from an interop that we held earlier um, uh, last year uh, where we bring a bunch of engineers together to uh, test all of this uh, equipment and these new systems uh, and um, and make sure that what the standard says can actually be uh, put in place and, and, and renders uh, the way we hope that it will on the actual TV set. These are examples of a lot of the APIs that are gonna be running on the interactive part of ATSC3. This, uh, again, was focused on the actual TV sets, but folks are looking at doing uh, single frequency networks and really with the idea of uh, putting television in the car. Now, this was an example that was shown uh, last year uh, of a Maserati that would have a TSC3 uh, built right in. Uh, but we also had a symposium in Detroit where we had automakers such as Honda, uh, General Motors, uh, Ford, all there, uh, and looking at different types of data applications and how those can be used uh, and, and leveraging uh, television broadcasting, not necessarily just to deliver entertainment, as was shown in that Maserati, but also to deliver data that can um, be applied to the car uh, for software updates or maps or other sorts of applications. Uh, and quickly, what we've done is we've had eight experimental markets that have been on the air, and then we've had a variety of markets that have announced their intentions to roll out. Uh, this really uh, talks about reaching over 71% uh, of the U.S. population uh, in launching these markets. Uh, because of coronavirus, we think this may be slowed a little bit, but we're still targeting uh, 40 or more markets for this year. Uh, Las Vegas would have been on the air uh, at NAB show. Uh, for you this year uh, were it not for the cancellation of that show. Um, we have authored a transition guide that our members uh, can use uh, to, to help them in their planning. Uh, and then that, I really just want to say thank you. And also, if I may, call your attention to uh, NAB Show Express, uh, which will be May 13th and 14th. Uh, that will be a virtual show that we at NAB are hosting. So uh, thank you um, for uh, allowing me to present to you today, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Sam, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. So uh, I think we have time for one or two questions. Uh, I have one from the attendees. Uh, the point is, uh, if we have only 10% uh, of antenna only uh, households, does it make sense or does it worth to invest in such a big change on ATSC 3.0 or the broadcast community thinks that uh, the adoption of the antenna will rise in the coming years? Yeah, so, um, so we have uh, really, again, about 30% of folks already are uh, using antennas uh, or have antennas. And so that's really uh, the, the number that we're starting from. And then what we've been seeing is that um, over-the-air usage or broadcast antenna usage has really been accelerating. So um, it has been growing for several uh, years, and we... Um, uh, what we're starting to see in our retail locations that sell television sets and, and other electronics is that more and more shelf space is being allocated for antennas. So um, we believe that over the air uh, it will continue to grow. Uh, it may even be accelerated by uh, the coronavirus with more folks sitting at home and also um, uh, having less disposable income to spend on pay TV services. 
Uh, so we're, uh, we think that that will grow, but broadcasters in the U.S. are very heavily partnered with uh, cable and satellite distributors as well, and those are very valuable relationships to us. And what really is exciting about Next Gen TV is the idea that it does work in a over-the-air environment, but it is so well suited to that combination of broadcast and broadband. And so uh, given those types of, uh, of opportunities, uh, we think it is very well worth uh, the uh, investment uh, in deploying the new technology. And our last question is, uh, given that uh, the spectrum in US is, is a red uh, shrink for the 600 megahertz bandwidth, how uh, NAB and the broadcasters will be able to manage uh, on, the, on the most competitive markets the adoption of ATSC 3.0. What yeah, is this strategy so, for adoption? Yeah, so um, I think the, the key thing there is that is, is, is twofold. Uh, one is that we do have less spectrum, and so it's very, very important that we do as much as we can with it. Uh, and so, um, and we feel like the adoption of uh, ATSC3 is really what enabled, for all of the reasons that Madeline really went through in terms of the, uh, the capabilities, uh, we, we actually get a 30%, roughly a 30% increase uh, in uh, spectral efficiency um, at the same signal to noise uh, ratio. So, um, A, we're getting more capacity out of that spectrum. Uh, we're going from 19.4 megabits per second in round numbers to you know 24 or 25 megabits per second. But then when you add in the HEVC encoding, uh, you really, really get a much greater capacity to do uh, stuff with the spectrum that you do have. So that's that's sort of one point. The other point is that because we are going through a repack, um, uh, roughly. Uh, a thousand of our stations have received funds to make that move. The government is reimbursing them. And so they're taking that money and they're buying the necessary equipment uh, to operate at that new channel. And because they're buying that new equipment uh, from uh, um, the vendors, uh, the latest and greatest equipment is, is uh, easily upgradable uh, to support ATSC3. Um, and so we're hoping that that will serve as a way to accelerate the deployment of uh, next-gen TV uh, because the uh, cost of entry just uh, came way down uh, for those stations that uh, have been repacked. Okay, so thank you very much, Sam. We're gonna you. have now Naomi from, is our last, last speaker. Naomi is the chairman of the IBC Council and uh, we are going to have a perspective of this uh, always changing uh, landscape and a view from Europe, which is very good as well. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate this. I will try to be brief. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about the future and talking about the future. And um, I spend time talking in this industry uh, to executives about the challenges of keeping pace with a changing industry. And um, often we'll start with a discussion about technology. But what I find is that we almost always end up talking about people and business. Um, generally we find that the tech challenges can be solved somehow and actually it's the people challenges and the business challenges but especially people that are much harder um, so even though we're a bunch of engineers um, there are the kinds of issues that we talk about are mostly people so i thought i would take you through the kind of obstacles to change uh, before covid came along um, and actually the things we end up talking about are things like getting the staff and the company to actually accept that there's any need to change. Um, there's issues around the skills, both for your existing employees and how to find new ones. I noticed that Rika mentioned that um, Disney now recruits more people with um, data in the job title than engineer. The skills are changing. Uh, obviously issues of adapting to new competition and new business models and then macroeconomic factors 
So there's lots of other things apart from technology, which um, the people I talk to say actually they have more trouble with. However, um, when the virus came along, um, actually suddenly um, that's a macroeconomic factor, but it's actually driven more changes than anything. Um, drastic change suddenly feels really possible. Um, so that I regard this as, a, a, as an opportunity, although obviously there are many very difficult things about the virus. Uh, and of course, broadcasting has played a really critical time um, in providing information and entertainment during the pandemic. Um, I'm certainly locked at home. I know many of you are locked at home. Um, and so actually there's been some rapid transformations in the industry, including remote working on a scale that was hard to imagine all sorts of new forms of production, new forms of distribution and new business models. And so um, talking through just some of the experiences that um, people around the industry, both on the broadcaster side and the supplier side, have told me about. Obviously revenues down, frankly, um, across the piece. And so a lot of thinking about how to recover and that's partly thinking about cost control but also it does mean people thinking about shifting their business model, going to more OTT or thinking about different ways of running their business. Uh, there's the gaps in the production that again have been mentioned, um, how to fill in all of the uh, production runs that were supposed to be happening right now. Um, so many companies, again, broadcasters and supply side are just rethinking everything they do. Um, rethinking the way that they, um, you know, they run their call centers, rethinking their supply chains. Um, again, wherever they are in the industry, they're looking at their supply chains and suddenly asking themselves how vulnerable those are, um, whether their suppliers are going to survive in the future. Um, and then the other thing that many of them have mentioned to me are the new cybersecurity issues that they're having to deal with because of the distributed working. And that's um, cybersecurity issues with their staff who are working at home, but also with many suppliers who manage their data who are now also working at home. So there's a whole set of new issues to deal with. But then on the human side, um, one of the things that I've heard quite a lot is that some of the leadership styles are changing. So some of those big, loud, physically charismatic leaders that do so very well in the office are not, not as inspirational over uh, Zoom. And so some, uh, some people are rising up as stars of the leaders um, in this new world that perhaps were unexpected. Um, and so I think that brings some interesting opportunities, at least from a diversity point of view. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on training and skills for change. Uh, people are having to adapt fast. And so this is quite a good time to train people um, and give them new skills. They may have a little bit more time without their commute. Um, and people seem to be more open to picking up some new skills. So many of the people I talk to are thinking about that. The other thing is that as, as, a, as humanity, we seem to have started to remember what's important in life. And so um, certainly here in Europe, companies that are not behaving ethically at the moment are getting a very bad press. And so the importance of doing things that matter, of doing meaningful things that matter in this world uh, has really come up the agenda. So in fact, corporate social responsibility is really important to companies, even though they are struggling with budgets, they're struggling with resources. Um, also, um, many of the people I've spoken to are expressing concern about how to look after their talent and how to look after their freelancers. Uh, a lot of freelancers have no work at the moment, um, and actually they're a really important part of this industry. Uh, so we need them to survive. Um, it's important that we look out for them and make sure they're still there and available uh, when everything gets back to normal. And the same goes for the supply chain, that, um, that it's in everybody's interest to support each other um, and to try and help everyone to come through this uh, and out the other side. So really, the, um, the, the last thing I, I was going to say, although it's an odd way to look at it, I know this is a really good time to drive through some rapid change, but it is important that we're thoughtful about that. It's such a great opportunity that it would be good as an industry to make sure we make changes that we're happy to live with after this, because I think many things will not change back. Um, and so people are open to this right now. 
also um, from an IBC perspective, and I'm sure NAB and IABM and, uh, and SET too, um, there is an opportunity for trade bodies and events companies to actually support the industry and find ways of helping them to cope with all of the things going on, the company consolidations that I think we'll see loss of revenues, very fragile business models, travel restrictions and so on. So I think there's a role that can be played there and also in the training and skill support. And um, I think there is an opportunity around um, sustainability and diversity and inclusion. Um, one of the comments I've heard is that this remote working is actually allowing some people that found it quite hard to participate at work uh, are finding it a lot easier to um, to get involved in things now that we're all working from home and so um, finding ways of continuing with that diverse workforce feels worth it so i think i will leave it at that raymundo thank you for the opportunity naomi thank you very much uh, for closing the session um, I, I have i have a question i would like to address uh, You've been involved with the broadcast community with the engineers for many years. Do you think uh, the mostly of the broadcast engineers that you have been discussing, do you think are they up to the task of this huge transformation that is going on? Do we have the right skills? Uh, are are the, in Europe, at least, the community, are they going under training process, adapting, or we, what we are seeing is people leaving the industry and then we have new people coming in? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, if you've ever seen a broadcast engineer um, on an outside broadcast that's gone horribly wrong on a critical global sporting event, the, the, the engineers are very capable in our industry, they're very creative, and they love to solve problems as any engineer does. And so, uh, you know, fundamentally, I think that the people that we have, have the capability they may not have the enthusiasm to move down a whole different path, but I think the capability is there. Um, and so my, my suspicion is that the answer will be a mixture of both. We, we absolutely need fresh, fresh blood coming into the industry. We need digital natives. We need people that have grown up with different kinds of technologies. Um, we need people that have grown up immersed in data. And so there is no question that having a continuous flow of of people with a different education and a different outlook is good for the industry. Um, but my, my instinct is that any broadcast engineer who's working today has a future in this industry if they're, if they're minded, but they may need to let go of some core expertise that they used to be the world-class expert in and learn something new. But things are, are changing so quickly that you can become a world-class expert in something new. Um, so it's a question of having the appetite for it. And right now, I feel like there's almost a, a zeitgeist that means people people want to do that people are ready for that so I, I think we should all rise to that challenge okay so thank you uh we are running out of time but i think uh, uh we have time for one last question to be shared among you four uh i i personally i've been involved on a bi-weekly meeting with a fellow uh, CTOs around the globe, people from England, from Italy, from Germany, from Australia, from Japan, from, from uh, Mexico and Colombia, and of course Brazil, and we are sharing and exchanging information of what we are doing to keep our operations going on and at the same time protect our employees. and. Uh, what I notice everywhere in the world is that we are adopting some new workflows, some new tools uh, that in normal uh, temperature and, and, and condition, on a, in a normal condition, it would take us six months, ten months discussing on endless committees to adopt one or two or three initiatives. And now, overnight, uh, we adopt so many different workflows. We have programmings being produced out of the cloud. 
Now we now have channels being played out over the cloud as well. 85% uh, of the employees are now working at home. In global, I have 600 people that work on post productions and they are working back home. So we were able to do that in a week. So it's big change. So my question for you is, is this for real? So do you think the, the coronavirus crisis is gonna change? It's gonna be a kind of a pivot to the industry or is just one uh, step forward and ever changing uh, movement? I would like to hear from you for before we close. May I start? Yes, Tom, please. Well, I, I just want to I want to build on what Naomi said earlier about engineers being really creative and how they can respond in an emergency, and, um, it, and that could be in a sporting event or it could be. Uh, that is all of a sudden having an issue or it could be uh, a coronavirus and from um, uh, To answer your question. I think that the coronavirus has served as a catalyst to get uh, folks to do things uh, that they otherwise would have taken a very long time to do um, things were gradually creeping towards using the cloud. Things were gradually creeping towards using remote uh, sorts of production tools. Um, and, you know, uh, necessity, um, you know, it, it, when uh, CBS is one of my examples. The CBS Broadcast Center in New York got shut down. And I've been talking with the engineering team there about, you know, how they manage that. Um, uh, but I've also talked with, uh, and, and that necessitated a lot of new uh, things to go into place. Uh, but I really, you know, rather than talking with the engineer, one of the one of the conversations I'll bring is is from talking to just a regional vice president who is responsible for running about 17 stations, not a technologist at all. And he just he said, Sam, he said, if you had asked me, you know six weeks ago, could we have done this? I would have told you no. no. He said, but what I will tell you is that the technology and the people behind it have been amazing. And we are now at 65% of our employees working remote uh, and we're going to 75%. And so I think that at that sort of management level, um, of somebody who's responsible for the profit and loss of the business more so than responsible just for the engineering aspects of it, they're going to look at things differently and they're going to operate differently going forward. And they're going to, um, uh, so I do think that this is a change. I do think it's here to stay. I don't think it's always going to be as dramatic as it is right now. I do think we will come back to somewhere in the middle but I do think that um, this has uh, served as um, both a crisis and a catalyst. Thank yeah, you. And I agree with um, Sam entirely. I think that's absolutely right. Um, and the, the only thing I would add is that I kind of hope that because it has reminded us that this kind of unthinkable thing is possible, I hope that even more kind of unexpected things, you know, we, we will do, uh, we'll do new radical things that perhaps we wouldn't have dared to do in the past because we've been reminded what's possible. Um, and so I, I hope to see more things in the future driven by perhaps more positive stimuli. But, um, but I, I agree with Sam, I think this is a pivot. Thank you very much, Naomi. Uh, Rika, would you like to add any point, an additional point? Yes, I also agree with Naomi and Sam, and also what Sam said that this has possibly been a catalyst um, and kind of push uh, to people to adopt uh, these remote um, working tools. And I think um, a little bit what Naomi uh, mentioned about freelancers um, and, and kind of different profiles of professionals who are in our industry, um, this kind of uh, unusual time when, uh, when it's actually your skills on this tool, when you, when you use your skills on these digital tools and cloud tools, that's what matters. I think also a um, little bit flats the hierarchy of people, how they can collaborate and really focus uh, on the 
what they have the substance and what they can deliver then um, another thing is also uh, interesting which all of the other uh, panelists were also referring to that that how quickly also um, uh, the, the buyer side of media technology buyer side or end user side is is able to adapt uh, for example i heard that um, the does own uh, sports uh, streaming um, provider that that they have of course uh, encountered a lot of a lot of changes now that we are not <laughs> having sports events uh, that they have started to now uh, stream chess tournaments and billiard uh, these kind of new um, sports and a kind of niche things so i think uh, this catalyst that sam mentioned is also the financial you know push that when you need to make money from something else then now it's time to then try out and uh, in in that way we we might see some innovative uh, things coming up which might become permanent after the crisis thank you rika madeleine would you like to add sure well uh, i agree with the other panelists that this is a catalyst for change particularly uh what we call cloudification of just about everything um, the big winners might be uh, AWS and Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud. We'll see. Um, I think the other thing that is going to happen is diversification of the supply chain. Um, I think that in some cases it's very easy and perhaps more efficient and uh, cheaper to use one big supplier to do a big job. And uh, it adds cost, complexity, and overhead if you want to diversify that. But I think that people are looking at the vulnerability of having one supplier for a given big piece and thinking to themselves, well, it's worth having diversity uh, because we've just seen what can happen when uh, one region, one country, one company, one whatever is no longer able to provide for us what we, what we, what we were trying to get. But uh, I'd like to kind of jump on to something that uh, one of the other panelists, Naomi or Sam, um, I think we're learning a lot about what we can do. I think it was Sam who was saying, you know, six weeks ago, if you asked me, could we do this? The answer would be no. And I think that as individuals, we have a lot of faith in, in our ability to be resourceful and adaptive and, and all that. But when we look at our organizations, and you think we're going to change the organizations we're going to we're going to turn the battleship around and we're going to do it on a dime um and people say no it's not possible there's no way you can't do it uh, actually you can and we'll see if uh if people are willing to um utilize their ability to pivot quickly again in the future, um, perhaps not in the face of a crisis, but in the face of a good reason to, to make a change. You, know, you want to make a change? Well, do it. You can do it. So we'll see if that lasts. <laughs> so thank you very much, Madeleine. So uh, as we are a little bit uh, late on our time schedule, uh, I would like to thank you, Rika, Madeleine, Sam, and Naomi for join me this afternoon for this seminar. I, I really uh, enjoyed a lot the discussions we had. And uh, thank you very much. Please uh, be safe and health. And I'm switching back to Portuguese to give some final remarks to the attendees. Thank you very much. Uh, bom, boa tarde, obrigado a todos pela audiência. Eu gostaria de lembrá-los de que o nosso evento da SET, né, que infelizmente teve que ser adiado, dada, essa nossa, dada a pandemia, já está com data combinada, né, será no dia 7 ao dia 10 de dezembro, né, em São Paulo, que é um momento da gente comemorar um ano que será é, inesquecível. E também não podemos deixar de, de participar aqui no dia 27 quando teremos mais uma sessão aqui do nosso webinar, na segunda-feira, 27, com o Raimundo Lima, meu xará, o Hugo Gadioni, e também com a, a presença do Jossi Fresco. Bom, é isso que eu tinha a falar para vocês, um agradecimento aos nossos patrocinadores, acho que tem sido uma experiência muito interessante, 
É uma tarde muito boa aí para vocês. Eu vou aproveitar o restinho do feriado aqui no Rio de Janeiro. Um abraço e até logo e até o próximo encontro na segunda-feira.